We're back with more Pokemon that were previously low tier and took a while to become bastions of the respective OU metagames. If you haven't seen the first video, make sure to check that one out as well. But here's the gist. Just because a generation stops being current doesn't mean it's no longer played. And as past gen OUs continue to be played, they continue to see significant metagame development, including the rise of previously rarely or completely unseen Pokemon. In the previous video, Advanced Moltres took the longest time to break into OU by far, taking about a decade between the end of advance and it being established as a legitimate threat. Everything in this video has taken at least a decade and a half to do the same, with the exception of the first Pokemon, which missed out on the feat just barely. And again, this is not about Pokemon who became good in the next generation, but instead it's about the ones who were discovered to be good in the same generation. So without further ado, let's jump back into the Pokemon that, given enough time, proved themselves to be great. And here are the top five Pokemon Pokemon who became good years later in singles. And also, here is a top 5 VPN because this video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Surfshark is an app and browser extension that allows you to place your computer or phone virtually in any country as if you're actually there. Surfshark has 3200 plus servers in 65 countries. And by using Surfshark to connect to servers in other countries, you can get access to content that is normally region locked. Rick and Morty's sixth season is out right now and I need to catch up on the series but it's not on Netflix. American Netflix, that is. If I change my IP to the UK, the first five seasons of Rick and Morty are right here and I only need to use Netflix. Surfshark encrypts your data and keeps it safe when you're connected no matter where you are. This comes especially handy when connecting to public Wi-Fi's. And Surfshark is also the only VPN service to let you use one account on unlimited devices. So you could have it on a phone, a tablet, Basically, if you have more than one device, you only need one Surfshark account. So if you want an awesome VPN and also support the channel to help us produce more content, you can use my promo code FALSEWIPE or check the link in the description below and get Surfshark VPN at 83% off and three extra months for free. In Generation 3, the type-based physical special split means Breloom doesn't have Grass Stab. Its spore was also not always too valuable a weapon in a metagame so populated by Rest Talk, fighting resistant Zapdos its most common user. However, eventually it was discovered that Sleep Talk doesn't burn sleep turns if you can't ride out the sleep without switching, and Rest Talk fell out of the metagame. And eventually, Breloom's time came. Its ability to threaten out tier staples in Tyranitar, Blissey, and Snorlax was enormous. First, it put something out of mission with Spore, which was huge in and of itself, then it launched a huge focus punch that stung even Resist like Zapdos. It wasn't just a one and done poke either. Its powerful Sky Uppercut was a strong stab move in one on one situations against the aforementioned targets even once Sleep Claws was active, while Mach Punch had the absolute incredible utility of checking the most dangerous sweeper in the tier. Dragon Dance Tyranitar, no matter how many DDs it had accumulated. Breloom could also turn the tier's fighting resist to its advantage. Any Salamence or Gengar looking to take it would get ruined by stuns for it, while Celebi and Clado got stung by HP bug. This made Breloom a team player as much as it was a threat in its own right. Breloom could even use an absurdly obnoxious substitute leech seed set. However, its greatest strength was always, of course, Spore. The one-up it provided via shutdown of a crucial opposing piece was vital for offensive teams to be able to break through otherwise irritating defense. This was similarly useful in faster-paced offensive slugfests. Breloom's presence in the metagame, which saw it eventually make the leap from BL to OU, caused a huge upsurge in Lumberry, Sleep Talk, and even calls to ban the sleep status as a whole. That's how obnoxiously impactful it was. In the beginning, GSC was characterized by the stalliest of dedicated stall teams. Then, offensive teams centered around Explosion flipped the metagame on its head. They took advantage of stall and took over the metagame. One couldn't go wrong with the offensive framework of Snorlax, Zapdos, Cloyster, Executor, Steelix, and the Filler. Eventually, the most defining one became Machamp. The consistency of these boom teams, as they were referred to, was nigh unparalleled. There was almost no downside to using them, even if the opponent knew they were coming, and that's what made them so good. Several players made such teams their trademark for this very 
very reason. Boom teams had such a stranglehold on GSC that several other players complained about it. They said they were too good and too difficult to stop reliably. GSC was too fast. Then Jinx came along. Jinx utterly shredded Boom offense teams. Their sleep talker, Zapdos, did not want to absorb sleep from its lovely kiss, terrified as it was of Jinx's mighty stab ice beam. Jinx's stab shredded pretty much every Pokemon on those teams that wasn't Snorlax. And Snorlax, great as it was, wasn't immovable, especially when it was the only thing holding these teams together from being run straight through by Jinx. Plus, Jinx was a superb user of Thief, and if Lax lost his leftovers, easier then. Jinx single-handedly changed the GSC metagame. It removed old-school boom offense from the tier in favor of a renewed all-out special attacking onslaught bolstered by Thief, and forced Snorlax into using sets with Sleep Talk just to slow it down. Effectively, it forced Lax to be a wall, and not a wall and an offensive threat. We haven't even mentioned Jinx's infuriating capacity to freeze. 10% isn't a lot, but when you're spamming Ice Beam left and right, the odds become nastily more in Jinx's favor. With each attack, and this is particularly devastating with GSC's paltry 10% defrost rate, Jinx encouraged entire teams to spam freeze-inducing moves, and was itself so effective in facilitating the strategy that it is almost solely responsible for the existence of freeze claws in GSC, despite the fact that it breaks game mechanics. Getting one freeze was often devastating enough, but two was just unfair, and Jinx helped its team achieve this far more than was healthy for the tier. Its efficacy in achieving just one freeze continued afterwards, to the point of some players wanting to ban Jinx itself for how much it encouraged fishing for luck. In addition to freeze, it also had a long track record of looking for 10% special defense drops with Psychic. It wasn't just a slot machine though, it was a ferocious offensive threat in its own right, and could even punish attempts to beat it through resting sleep talking walls by slotting Nightmare into his last move slot. And so Jinx completely changed Gen 2 OU a decade and a half after it had ceased to be the current generation. And speaking of Pokemon that changed to OU a decade and a half after it had ceased to be the current generation, next up is Golem. Its impact wasn't quite as seismic as Jinx's, but it really wasn't far behind. While it didn't knock entire team styles out of the tier, what it did do was reshape existing team styles into a greater focus on Rapid Spin, even on offensive teams which previously couldn't spin most of the time. Rapid Spin and Explosion were illegal on the same Cloyster set, and most of the time, you wanted Cloyster to boom. It being offensively threatening was a big reason for it being as spammable as it was. Fortress didn't have this problem, but it was much, much more difficult to fit onto teams than Cloyster thanks to its pathetic speed, crippling quadruple fire weakness. Thus, you couldn't fit spin on your spiker most of the time. Plus, relying on one Pokemon to spike and spin could sometimes be too much for it to do in one battle. What about using other Pokemon to spin? Well, on bulky teams, maybe, but you weren't fitting the highly passive Starmie on offense, especially since it didn't provide much necessary defense utility for them. It could be tough to slot even on bulky teams for this reason. With Golem, this all changed. It was a rapid spinner that possessed both the defensive qualities necessary for every team, i.e. a normal resistance to help against Snorlax, meaning it could roar out a sleeping Curselax without fearing a boosted sleep talk normal move, and a thunder resist or immunity to help pivot around the dangerous electric Zapdos and Raikou. And it did this while still being offensively threatening thanks to Explosion. Of course, with its sets of Earthquake, Rapid Spin, Roar, and Explosion, it couldn't actually threaten Zapdos without booming. But that was the beauty of Golem. It didn't need to. Rapid spinning and clearing spikes away for his teammate Snorlax was all it needed to do, as a lax not being worn down by spikes was nearly immortal. Another thing that made Golem superb was how it was nearly impossible to spin block. Gengar was instantly dropped by its earthquake, while Mistravis was slammed quite hard as well. Golem was great on stall teams as well, but it was most defining for how it changed offense. It went from never being seen to becoming the most used rock type in the tier, more common than Tyranitar, and almost completely displacing Rhydon. While also eclipsing the previous ground type standard on offense, Steelix. And so Golem changed the metagame and became one of the best Pokemon in Gen 2 OU. For a long time, RBY games began with Alakazam facing down another Alakazam, or a Starmie. They would exchange Thunder Waves, then see who would be forced to switch out first. The rest of these teams would be occupied by, of course, the big four of Tauros, Snorlax, Chansey, and Exeggutor. And their last was, quite commonly, Rhydon, a hard counter to the terrifying Zapdos and a monstrous offensive threat in its own right. This set of six was reliable, consistent, dominant, all that good stuff. And once that Alakazam or Starmie took paralysis, they were almost 
single-handedly ruined by Victory Bell. It was faster than everything except Tauros, which allowed it to get free turns with Rap. And it wasn't just threatening with Rap, though it also wielded a powerful Razor Leaf, which was an automatic critical hit coming off of Victory Bell's strong special set. You couldn't safely switch around it, because whatever came in would be slower, meaning it gets stuffed by Rap, and its Razor Leafs hit hard. Your one faster Pokemon would be Tauros, and using Tauros to try and deal with Victory Bell was favorable for the Victory Bell user. The chip damage forced on Tauros alone was useful for Victory Bell's own Tauros to gain a huge advantage, but Victory Bell could also choose to Stun Spore and ruin Tauros entirely. Alternatively, Victory Bell made excellent use of Hyper Beam, which allowed it to finish off Chansey from much higher ranges. Victory Bell was so good you almost forgot that it also packed Sleep Powder, of all things, but it most certainly did, allowing it to shut down an opposing Pokemon even more directly and provide a window for it to launch its Razor Leafs. Blocking its Sleeps wasn't exactly easy either. After all, you needed to be paralyzed for that to be the case, and if you were paralyzed, you were going to be vulnerable to Rap. Victory Bell dominated teams so hard that it caused a shift in how RBY was played. Suddenly, lead Psychics no longer wanted to take Paralysis unless there was a second fast Psychic in the back, lest they get completely thrashed by Victory Bell. And as a result of Victory Bell teaching OU this lesson with such brutal force, it rolls from BL to join the tier itself. Finally, we have some honorary mentions. Advanced Charizard rose in a manner similar to Moltres. It wasn't as powerful and lacked Will-O-Wisp, but it had significant advantages and higher speed, as well as access to Focus Punch and Dragon Claw. DPP Quagsire appeared at the end of the generation to stifle the Life Orb Starmie, Offensive Suicune, and Choice Specs Kingdra running wild everywhere, and was generally a pain for offensive teams to handle, as it also stuffed offensive Zapdos and many Heatran variants incredibly hard. In black and white, Mian Shao rose for its outstanding speed tier and incredible offensive threat level, becoming both a ferocious life orb attacker and a reliable choice guard for Venge Killer and Cleaner. There are so many more Pokemon that could be mentioned in these types of videos, but maybe we'll see them next time. we finish this with Moltres once more, marking it as the only Pokemon in these videos to appear in two different generations. Three if you count its honorary mention in the previous video, and the second Pokemon in these videos to appear in OU, despite being tiered as low as NU. This time, it's marked as a tremendous late discovery in RBY OU, two decades after it stopped being the current, or rather only, generation. Generally, Burn isn't a status you toss around carelessly in RBY. It only deals 6.25% per turn, so Pokemon like Alakazam, Starmie, and Chansey even welcome it, as it allows them to block sleep, paralysis, and freeze, all of which are far more reliable at forcing progress on the opponent. Indeed, fire moves in general are rare precisely because by using them, you risk undoing the effective KO you scored on the opponent by freezing them in the first place. However, when played to its strength, burn can be utilized to great effect, both on Tauros and, of course, on Moltres. At first, Articuno was seen as the underrated bird in RBYOU, because its blizzard is the strongest special attack in the game, even stronger than Mewtwo's Psychic. Problem with Articuno is that when it's walled, such as when it faces Lapras or Cloyster, it's walled. It has very little way of making its way past its checks itself. Moltres didn't have this problem, and thus established its role. First generation, Fire Blast has a 30% chance to burn. Thank Arceus that didn't stick around. Now alone, 6.25% from burn isn't that much. However, in conjunction with the unstoppable force chip damage from Fire Spin, the opponent can very quickly be put in an uncomfortable position, and when Moltres agility's late game, outspeeding the Alakazam or Starmie it's burned, it can easily chip Starmie down. Moltres also boasts over Articuno a higher attack stat, and thus a much more powerful Hyper Beam it can use to seal the deal against Starmie, Chansey, and Alakazam. As a result, even Moltres' checks aren't necessarily safe against it, and things that aren't its checks get destroyed by its Fire Blast that is tied for the strongest special attack in the game. So Moltres didn't become a metagame defining threat, but it did become a legitimate tournament-worthy Pokemon in RBYOU. Thanks for watching, everyone. And in the comments, again, I want to know what type of different videos would you like to see? We've been loving the feedback you've been giving us so far, so thank you so much for that. But we'd love to know more ideas that you want to see in the future. And thank you to our patrons for continued support of our videos, and thank you to everyone else watching as well. And follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.